Okay, welcome back. Um, I think we'll just wait for the recording to start. There seems to be some issue, but I think we'll just get started. And I'll just keep an eye on that. Um, yeah, so we were looking at um, uh, how do we, uh, we identify different forms of abuse. And we also looked at what are some of the warning signs what are some of the warning signs of abuse as well um, uh, just before we move on to um, understanding some uh, some ways that uh, you could you could help i think uh, it, it's also just to uh, have an understanding of how do we recognize some signs uh, of abuse so we do like we've noticed and we said that it is uh, a very sensitive subject for people to talk about to deal with whatever the nature of the uh, abuse is or whoever the perpetrator is. Um, uh, it's important, however, to spot what the signs are and how they can, you can find support. Um, uh, number one is to understand that people with any kind of care or support needs, especially those who are elderly, people with disabilities are generally more likely to be the ones who are abused or neglected. Um, they're generally seen as an easy, easy target and uh, are probably the less likely that also to, uh, to report. Uh, a history of abuse or violence in the background of the perpetrator is another sign is a telltale sign like many abusers themselves would have been victims uh, but whatever the reason may be it does not uh, give, give it any chance to excuse that behavior uh, it is not it is not a, a right to make to threaten to frighten or to bring about any form of assault or harm to others okay uh, abuse also is something that happens slowly and it's not something that you may see immediately. So one of the main characteristics of abusive relationships is, like we said, is control, which is often um, uh, achieved through force or through manipulation. So in, in your interaction with people, if you suspect that a relationship is overly controlling, uh, you may begin to see the signs of coercive behavior or you notice that, uh, you know, someone's behavior is change, changing. It's good to be there uh, to be the right kind of support. Okay. Um, if you suspect that someone is being abused, the important thing to do is ask them how they're doing. And uh, they may not really truly open up to you at first place, uh, but they will at least know that uh, you are there to support them and uh, that there is a comfort also also looking for physical signs of abuse especially if they are those who are you know if it is the physical violence or physical injuries that's something that uh, you can keep yourself um, you can look out for as well okay now um, before we go into uh, what is, what is it as a counselor that we do i just want to probably bring about some well, especially when we're looking about domestic violence or you know physical abuse, um, I think it's important for us to um, uh, you know to to have an understanding uh, about about uh, you know as believers, um, uh, what is what is the understanding that we have of a problem like domestic abuse, um, uh, and when does when what does it look like? So um, I, the the first thing to to bring about is um, to know that uh, uh, you know even as as a person is talking to you that an abuser is one someone who will exhibit that disrespect uh, control insult devaluing their partner um, and which can of course evolve uh, involve uh, physical verbal aggression uh, or even sexual maltreatment now um, I think what we need to also understand is, can we say abusers, will, do abusers, is there, is there some, do the, these abusers have hope? And I'm specifically talking about violence uh, also, okay? Now, depending on the nature and the severity of uh, what the abuse may be, um, these, there may be need to be a period 
of uh, a, a, a no contact period with the abuser or a restricted contact. Now, what does this do is this allows the members of the family to concentrate on their own personal healing and uh, their, their, their growth without the pressure of needing to interact with the party who is offending or the fear of, of it happening once again. Once the abuser uh, has spent time to really go in for some kind of help or uh, treatment or, or also is showing the willingness to, to change or willingness to work through things, um, a, a spouse probably should uh, should then only choose to to begin to inter uh, a, you know like like interact or start um, again um, uh, you know coming into con in contact with the partner again the decision is not made uh, should not be made too early or in isolation and I think it's that's where a Christian counselor and maybe a pastor or trusted people can help the uh, uh, the victim to see red flags and to know when is it that trust or reconciliation can be carried out or whether it is premature, whether it is unwise. Um, you know, we need to understand that there can, abusers uh, can conceal their abusiveness when they want to. Uh, after all, you know, uh, after all that, you know, they can they can ensure that they, they keep that under wraps. So, um, but, but an abuser who has not truly changed how he perceives or how he thinks can often get back into the same pattern and can deceptively ensure that uh, you know the spouse comes back home like you know promises or you know making uh, huge claims um, but unfortunately we see that sometimes when they're back, this brings uh, it, it. It worsens the entire thing. The abuse worsens because now it, it could be they, they're very angry and upset for putting the the person through all of that. So, um, you know, through statistics. Now I'm telling you what statistics is that generally uh, abusers changing are low, um, and it is important for the spouse to remember that they may be tempted to believe that everything is okay or you know hangs on this desire that there's going to be a miracle and stay in that relationship so it does not mean that you do not pray uh, or, or look at god to bring about a supernatural change um, but it is to know that you know change happens only when the abuser also allows God to bring about um, a change in heart, um, because you know the, the entire uh, um, outcomes of abuse is so so hard and so devastating um, that you know you, the the spouse should be empowered to really see a proof of change before believing in it. Um, so the question again becomes, okay, what happens? Do you join these people together or not? So uh, to also know that regardless of however bad the abuse has been and however, uh, you know, how much of hurt or uh, maltreatment there has been, uh, you're helping the other person to forgive just as, uh, just as God has forgiven us. However, Forgiving may not mean that you perm that the, the the victim should put themselves back in the way of uh, the abuser. Uh, it, it does not mean that um, uh, you know living together or or being staying with the person uh, who has not repented and changed his thinking or changed his way is something that you should move back into. So if a spouse, an abusing spouse, gets the help they need and is being transformed and the wounds of their partner is also healing, then we know that reconciliation is possible. But I would again say the wisdom of being reconciled after being 
uh, after having an abuse should be considered on a case to case basis okay you cannot you may not be able to say that all people who've been abused should reconcile and live together there are very many cases that's there and there is, there should be appropriate understanding and counsel as it goes um uh, goes through a reconciliation process so someone a spouse who does not uh, does not have to reconcile with someone who has abused uh, them uh, and and need need not be in in a place of shameful or a or a uh, you know spiritual indictment if they choose not to do so because you know we, we do see that uh, a lot of times uh, the uh, the in different cases it, the extent and the severity and the pain and uh, you know the the multiplication of abuse it may just not be physical it could be other other kinds of uh, issues as well to also understand that abuse um, so something that we need to know is that domestic violence or abuse is not a marriage problem okay it is not it's not a problem within the marriage okay it is not something where you give them marriage counseling and things will be will be different domestic domestic violence or physical violence at in a marriage is a problem of the abuser is a problem that the abuser has and uh, uh, and and i think a lot of people struggle with this uh, truth because they are uh, aware of you know their own weakness so, so maybe the spouses feel uh, they have led the physical abuse to happen and these abusers take advantage that uh, you know the, the blame has been taken on by the victim and uh, continues to uh, you know perpetrate that entire thing and they may at a point of time get them to accept that uh, you know that that blame uh, so as professional counselors and you know as ministers um uh, especially when we are not in in reality with what domestic abuse and viol violence happens we may we may really uh, you know, we sometimes in a need to help, we end up um, uh, working alongside with the abuser. So during a counseling session where an, an abuser is present, you may find the partner finding it extremely difficult to articulate um, with, with any specific uh, ability or force on what is happening to them. Okay, and uh, they may they may feel quite intimidated, particularly if the minister or the counselor is very sympathetic to the manipulative abusers' uh, complaints about their spouse. So, and this can often become uh, add on to the injury. So, what what you're looking at is individual counseling for an abuser. Uh, should be targeted at changing the abuse of thinking and behavior, and that is the best source of uh, uh, action that you will you will need to look on, along with, of course, prayer and working through the word. Um, only when you see sincere, prolonged change in the abuser uh, would would any kind of marital counseling have any kind of an effect. Um, so the but on the other side, the spouse and the maybe the children is uh, they could benefit from. Uh, from from getting probably shelter and and support and um, you know working on the emotional healing and emotional pain. So that's something that you know I just wanted to bring about to understand. With regard to um, sexual abuse, um, I think one way to uh, this this is this is not about counseling, but this is about uh, knowing also how to prevent and deal with it. So even in things like physical violence. Uh, especially when you know when when you are doing premarital work, it is important to help couples look through how they cope during stressors. What have been their coping patterns? And uh, there are certain red flags that red flags that may be evident during you know the process of courtship, the process of uh, dating, and these are things that. Uh, definitely need to be highlighted and brought forth. So what are some of the red flags that you would notice in, in couples and in, in the way that uh, couples uh, deal with stress? How do they cope with stress? Now, to come, with, to come about sexual abuse as well, uh, one of the important things, even as ministers, as, as people within a church community to do is to help um, not just 
parents, uh, but even educators um, and you know ministers, all of that to to bring about a knowledge that children need to be empowered about their bodies and about knowledge of their bodies and what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. And that's where sex education plays a huge role, uh, not just in, uh, you know, in, in settings where, uh, uh, like, like in institutional settings, but even at the home, being able to educate children uh, about sex and sexuality is the role of a parent to start young that does not mean you tell a, a two or a three-year-old child about the process of uh, sexual intercourse that's not what it means but for them and and that there, there, there are graded ways in how you bring about an education so uh, as young as they may be two years old is number one is to be able to um, make them aware of their body parts and uh, help them see that each of their body parts are as important as any other part of the of the other body and that it is not treated with shame but in fact double honor like how scripture says you know you treat them with double honor and that's why they aren't exposed and they are kept private so to give them an insight like that to help them see that every body part is god given god God made and to, to be given its due respect um, and not just their own bodies but the bodies of the other other also and as they grow up a bit more maybe when they're three four years old is to help them see that uh, it cannot be violated nobody else can um, uh, you know touch or uh, or do anything without uh, do anything uh, that is uncomfortable for them um, without their consent. And if that were to happen, it should be reported or it should be brought about. So the freedom to expose children to that knowledge and that understanding is a role that um, you know parents need to take up to help them see that these body parts are their own and cannot be violated, cannot be touched unless and of course until it is for a bath by significant caretakers like the parents or uh, whoever else is instituted there, or for a doctor's visit or, or things like that. You know, so uh, that kind of a knowledge base is what we what you need to give. Also educating parents of um, helping the child to determine um, when they are uncomfortable about body touch. Like, um, you know, very often, especially in our Indian customs, I've seen that um, you know, parents have um, encouraged young children to go give hugs to maybe to probably an uncle or an aunt that that uh, that has come in for a holiday uh, when the child is truly uncomfortable so to be able to give the child the um, uh, the freedom to to do that uh, should you know really enhances their understanding that you know i can i have uh, I, I am able to uh, put myself put boundaries or or put those limits on who can who can um, physically express their love or or, or um, you know attachment to me so so as parents being careful uh, I, and i would also say when you know um, especially when we are as a part of church and things we often go and maybe hug the child carry the child and they are wriggling out and you're holding them tight you know be uh, um, uh, be wise in doing that and you know ask the child permission can i carry you or would you like to give me a handshake or can i give you a hug uh, you know and and it is it, it is respectful to us that and if they say no be respectful enough to to keep away from that right uh, or and and as best as possible engage with them only um, you know in which is acceptable you know like a handshake or a uh, or a head tap uh, uh, and all of that and, and nothing more than uh, you know something that makes a child uncomfortable the fact here is how do you how do you uh, help children to understand what could be abuse is anything that they feel uncomfortable about anything that they do not experience a good and a warm feeling about is is definitely something that you will uh, you know you will help the child to discern and of course any, anybody who touches them at the specific private parts is something that is uh, um, should should be educated 
and as they keep moving on giving them more information about uh, about um, sex and sexuality and you know as they progress into the preteens and into the teen years keeping that knowledge a lot more um uh specific and true and even honest for that matter uh, I, recently i was doing a workshop for parents uh for mothers and uh, there was a question that was uh, you know i had asked the mothers and said you know what if your four, four year old child comes and asks you mom where did where are babies born what would you say and a lot of the parents said i bought you from the hospital or god put you in my stomach or you know uh, you came out from my stomach uh, now you know you you've got to be a little more smarter in answering your questions because there's going to be a point of time that you know if if you haven't given your child the right information they will seek it from somewhere else uh, because it wasn't satisfactory so some of these things are uh, you know just just pointers to to um, help these are all preventive techniques you know things that you do so that you do not actually um you know uh, get your child to be in a place where they they could potentially be abused okay uh, any questions here if not we will go on to the last part of what can we do how could we how could how can we help when someone does approach us in um you know with with any of these issues any questions or or i can go on okay there aren't any questions okay so uh, what do we do when uh, uh, how how can you help okay so the first and foremost thing is when someone comes in and tells you uh, their story it's important to trust and believe and listen to the story okay um many i i i can i can actually tell you at least of 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 10 counselees who come you will have seven or eight counselees who share you know especially those who have been abused share and say how when they have approached an elder or a or a or a caregiver like a parent or a teacher they have not been listened to and they've always been faulted for the fact that they've come in and said a story like that you know so they they they've been sent back saying maybe you're imagining things or that uncle is too good to do anything like that or uh, you know what are you doing uh, in order to make the abuser behave like this to you so remember whenever someone comes and shares this with you the idea the the point is to believe it believe it listen to what they have to say and confirm and and uh, appreciate the fact that they have come to you with that uh, situation now even if you may uh, know the person that is involved and again these are stories that you would have someone talk to you and say you know this is a this is a a, a man of god who's done it or a leader who's done it or a or a uh, you know a, a someone in a pastoral group that's done, done it even if you can't believe that the abuser Uh, could do this it is important to keep an open mind and give the opportunity for them to tell their story okay it is it is very very uh, crucial that you do it because that like i said there have been so many times people have not taken help because they've been put off by the way that uh, that those in power and authority and help could have helped them in some way okay the next thing is that uh, uh you know be conscious of the fact that they may not see themselves as people who are abused and uh, uh to help them see that what has gone with them has been wrong uh and that is was unkind that was not the right thing to do um and uh, it it is important it is important to label the what the abuses name the be behavior for what for what it is without actually attacking the abuser so like for example you know uh, you have been sexually violated or you have been emotionally hurt through somebody's behavior so you're not what you're helping them to see is that the abuse in itself is absolutely wrong and that's something that uh, that shouldn't have happened also to make them aware that it is not their fault it is not their fault that they are in a place like that and uh, that that uh, you 
you you will do especially when it comes to children you will do the best that you can to help and to protect them in whatever way possible okay again to appreciate their courage in bringing about this this uh, uh situation to you and uh, that that by doing so that they have done the right thing that by by seeking that help that they have done the right thing it's important to also know a little bit more so ask questions about whether the abuse is even currently going on and what has been taken place in the past so you to have a good history of it to probe into it is perfectly okay because you have a better picture of of what kind of a danger the person is in okay um it's important to continuously be supportive okay and uh, uh, also uh, now especially when when you're dealing with children it is uh, children or adults it is important to give them options on how they can make better decisions um so it it really also matters now if you're having a very young child let's say a 6 or a 7 year old child who's coming to you um there may be certain things that you may need to take a, a bit of a, um uh uh you know a, a a proactive step on one is to be able to enlist the support system that is there in the child's environment okay so that is the thing you to do who who all are there in your environment that you can actually go and share this with okay that's one secondly is um uh if uh, if there is immediate danger okay like like for example they are staying with the person it may be important to intervene in such a way to keep them away from that uh, abusive environment also so that would mean taking the help you know getting the support of the child and taking the help of one caretaker to ensure that they are in a safe space um so it is so even you this is maybe certain things that you're doing with the child but let's say if it is a if it is a, a person who's being physically abused it is important to give them options and help them make that decision so that they themselves will be responsible for that decision and not saying you know you must leave the home and get out uh, uh, you know they they may say i did it because they did it and then you know if they have to get back in some some way back to the house it can get uh, significantly difficult okay um uh, the 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 exception to all of this is if there is if their lives are in danger it is important to take action so that they are in a safe space okay uh, the next thing that is important to do is keeping the conversation confidential and not contacting the abuser okay uh, and uh, uh discussing this in especially uh, uh especially if they haven't given you permission and even talking to the to the to the abuser in front of the victim so the the best thing is not to be able to not to give away any information um but of course if you need to enlist support from somebody that's something that you know you take permission uh, to do and get the right person to involve so that you know there is safety that is provide um Uh, again it's important especially in times of physical abuse uh, and uh, sexual abuse not advising them to return home you know to to change things with the abuser because they you know they could the next time you know they could just land up being dead right so never advising them that it is christian for you to go home and forgive and reconcile and do what they say remember we said it's not a marriage issue often it is it is the issue with the with with the abuser okay now in case the the victim does choose to return without uh in despite your uh, advice make sure that they have some ways of how they can get in touch with you if they require help um uh, maybe you know also being able to follow up or finding helping them to find ways in getting connected to somebody else who can help them through this um the point is ensuring that there isn't a force on anything and uh, that they need to be ready to make whatever decision or be responsible for the kind of situations that uh, that may need to follow okay so these are at least definitely some things that Uh, as lay counselors as lay ministers that that you can do mm, it is important to 
especially if you are in a minister role and you have a senior pastor, it is good to get the support and the help of the senior pastor so that you can work in as a team to work through uh, issues of abuse, any kind of physical, emotional, uh, sexual abuse. So um, I, I'll give you an example of, of uh, one such, uh, such family where there was significant physical abuse between the parent and the child. The child is around uh, 17 years old. And, um, and, and the mother was the one who came in with help. However, she was unwilling to take any kind of a support system. Uh, but over time, the best way that she found dealing with it is to keep the child away in an in a in another relative's house and keep that um, you know keep keep the child away from the parent and that worked for some point of time and that helped in the way that they dealt with it but um, remember you know you you cannot go you, you do not force them into making a specific decision that they may not be ready to make okay uh, any questions up onto here Okay, now in every, um, uh, like in every situation, um, how do we, how, how do we as believers help is um, help them. One is to help people go through their journey of healing. Okay, there is, like we said, uh, extreme emotional trauma. And uh, the, uh, what you point them back is to finding um, God's power, God's healing, God's word, uh, as they as they go through the process of uh, transformation, and this is not a one day affair. Okay, this is not something that can be done within one or two sittings. But this may be uh, a, a mentorship that happens for some period of time. Okay, so plugging them into different forms of uh, um, you know getting support from from like-minded people, maybe into a cell group, getting support through a Christian counselor, getting them into uh, activating the word over their lives, um, you know, engaging in maybe special schools and special ministries where uh, they, they receive their healing, um, basically getting them back to scripture, getting them back to the word of God through all these difficulties, through different methods and through different means, where they are able to really experience the hope that they have in Christ despite what is going on. Coming to a place of forgiveness and being able to release and resolve those emotional wounds that are there. Again, uh, you know, this sometimes takes takes years to happen, even though, you know, and, and I know that we, we've all got, experienced some kind of emotional wounds and we do see that, you know, there are seasons that we feel extremely healed and, and um completely uh, 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 set free and you know with with smaller issues that come up these things come up again so to be able to renew and transform uh, to to progressively keep being in a place of uh, sanctifying your heart and your life with the truth. So just being able to apply the word of God in different ways, in different uh, um, situations is, is very important. And of course, through, through counseling or through work, what you're doing is also helping them to improve their relationships with, with the people that that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that have been affected now this is only if um, it is absolutely necessary like for example if there is a child who's been abused by an uncle there is absolutely no need to improve that relationship but then just within the family maybe you know those who uh, who are other key members of of the of the family or or people who where, where relationships have been messed up as a result of things over time is what you would engage in but not with the abuser and the uh, and the victim that's something that we especially if it is if it is uh, uh, something to do with the sexual contact and things like that but yes in physical violences like we said i think we discussed about that reconciliation is something that you would look on a case to case basis however um, you know each individual definitely requires uh, a time of healing and a time of uh, uh, emotional wholeness 
before they before they can reconcile into the uh, into the relationship but forgiveness and releasing of those wounds is definitely something that you work through even uh, in in christian discipleship and counseling okay all right i i have come to a close over here is uh, so we have around five to ten minutes and we could just take some time to maybe quest answer any questions or any doubts or any clarifications any observations the class has been awfully quiet today no questions uh I yes, have... Abhi. Yeah. So now, uh, this is a this is a scenario where you know the couple is uh, both retired people, but mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, the wife doesn't even know that you know what she's been facing through all these years has been kind of abuse. Like people generally take it as a nature of a person, you know, he has this kind of a nature, you know, where they are dominating, where they are manipulating, mm -hmm. where they are being, you know, very controlling in nature. So, you know, women, they, they just try to uh, put things in right place so that the family is not affected and they're not even aware that it is some kind of an abuse where they need help. And so they have, uh, they never approach outside for help or something and they just continue. But eventually there is uh, those signs which ma'am you shared like anger or you know depression and anxiety takes over and and in that case and since it's been a, like maybe 35 years of marriage 40 years of marriage they become so used to that kind of a lifestyle where they mm -hmm. they think now what is the use of getting any help or coming out of it you know we've almost lost so many years and now we are used to we know what is going to happen but but they are suppressed they are so much in you know anxiety and uh, the, the the impact on the family is great of it like the children mm -hmm. they are also suffering mm -hmm. in similar patterns of life so ma'am how can we help such a person like in that scenario of course uh, one thing that you affirmed which i also found was listening to them uh, you know, pouring their hearts out. But uh, after a point of time, you know, that there is a repetition of just listening. <laughs> they have the same stories to tell. They have nothing new because for them, uh, it is just a part of life and just, you know, gives a temporary relief uh, when they pour out their hearts. But uh, they don't have any significant change uh, in their uh, relationship or in their uh, overall scenarios. And the life is like, so mechanized that uh, you know mm -hmm. coming out and taking a decision means a big change and not everyone is prepared to go through that uh, change right. in order to bring some uh, something in better in their life so ma'am how how can we you know help such people and especially when you know maybe uh, you've known them from your childhood and you you've observed those things but um uh, you 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 don't know how to help them ma'am so that's uh... yeah so so i think uh, you know uh, it is it is difficult especially when you see elderly couples uh, who have just lived very many years in such a destructive dysfunctional pattern that they may not be uh, may not be as much as physical abuse then they may be emotional as they grow older uh, but then, you know, you will see the manifestations of it, of how the affected spouse begins to pay back. I've seen many, many couples where you see the affected spouse pays back uh, in some way, especially when there is weakness in the, um, you know, in the abuser of the past. Uh, they pay back in the sense of withdrawal of, of love or withdrawal of, uh, uh, you know, even even just interactions and they kind of get into their own space and their own lives and everything is so so isolated and you see that this has come as a result of the hurt and the pain that has built up over years now the question is by empowering them 
is there going to be any difference? Uh, like, for example, let's say an old man of 78 and an old woman of 75. Uh, what's the idea of keeping them apart from one another because of, let's say, emotional issues that have happened in the past? Uh, you know, either of them are going to, uh, it is not a scenario that is going to be practical in itself, right? Because as, as you age, you need one another um, for the sake of just, just probably living, maybe kids aren't around and, and all of that. So how much does the separation and all of that really work? I don't think it does. Okay, so we, we may need to use a lot bit more of wisdom and practicality. And one thing, like you said, yes, listening is one thing that you do. The other thing that I've definitely found helpful is, um, you know, and, and this is this is great if couples, maybe younger couples or middle-aged couples can minister to older couples, you know, in, in ways where these discussions or these things uh, are bought up or let's say some form of um, like a mini life group that happens between couples that can be extremely edifying when uh, when you when you know when you work uh, through uh, especially through couples like this just to help older couples or whatever middle aged couples work together with some other couple who is able to take them through their everyday walk of life. Do people like this take professional help? In fact, you will see that a lot of them don't want professional help because, you know, for the very reason that you said that, um, you know, they, they're, uh, they're, they're ready, you know, to finish their life. Basically reconciled with that scenario. With the scenario. Or that the fact that nobody else can actually who can tell me anything what to do i mean you know how how is a young person going to going to really speak so what needs to be what i see is most effective is when when there can be normal people you know or uh, people in different walks of life being integrated into their life and working things out alongside with them you know uh, establishing communication establishing openness establishing certain um you know codes of how do we behave and talk to each other and all of that can happen you know just in conversations in normal uh sitting room conversations with other couples so i think that seems to be the most effective one if you know as ministry couples could just work alongside with older middle-aged couples it really can can help the other thing that i've often also seen is when children step in when children step in and have begin, begun to see the inequality that's been there and uh, children speak into the lives of the uh, abuser parent, um, you know, that also is something that, that works. So children step in like those, uh, those counselors within the home, that sometimes also is, is uh, useful. Uh, then, of course, uh, you know, pastors, but, but again, uh, you have to walk life with them not just do it on a one-off basis because uh, it, it's only it's only as you walk life with them do they open up and do they share and you're able to speak into their lives and i see those are probably the uncharted the unprofessional the uh, you know not the bookcase the classical textbook case interventions generally don't help it's it's these daily um, day to day interactions that really bring about some form of change and some form of awareness. Apni. Thank you, ma'am. But uh, what uh, one point which I missed out in the in this particular case is the whole issue of needing help began when their you know middle aged son tried to suicide, commit suicide. So. Uh, mm. The impact of the family thing no, was seen in this way it came out when you know they only could ask for the mother could you know ask for help when she found that the father is hostile towards even that particular need of the child, child. He's continuously threatening not only threatening he tried he was by grace of god saved but he is going into that mode again and again and uh, because the father is not willing to take any help external help and um, a very, very, very difficult scenario where, you know, 
the mother is completely helpless uh, where mm. you know one one side she's seeing the son suffering on the other side the father not taking any any uh, step to bring about any help or any change yeah. in the family so it was mm. very very difficult so so i think in cases like this also like we say if if there is you know just like you would uh, recommend separation something that you would probably recommend with the son is to uh, stay apart from the family and work on his own issues you know because if you are if the if the son is in an environment in a toxic environment where there is significant uh, uh, abuse and um, you know any form of belittling and all of that that happens it isn't a healthy home right so uh, uh, because i mean it, it's easier for a child to stay separate than for a spouse to uh, but you know recommending that doing that till a point of time that the, he can have healing of his own before a reconciliation can take place is is something that you would also look into like remember these are all case by case basis okay uh, don't don't think that you know every family whether where there is an issue between parents there should be a uh, you know that they should stay apart that's not what i'm saying it's a case by case basis if if you are in a toxic if you are in an unhealthy dysfunctional system where uh, where you would see the symptoms of a child for a child or an adult child worsening it's important to keep them away for some point of time till they can work on themselves and find healing of their own so that's something that also you know quite unconventional but but maybe yes. that's that's a possibility yes ma'am that's true thank you so much ma'am yeah okay all right let's uh, just close with a word of prayer um, and we'll close today's class heavenly father we thank you lord for bringing us to this place of uh, of help lord we see around many people who suffer and go through significant difficulties lord in the closed walls of their home lord and uh, lord sometimes when we look at whatever happens around we feel helpless but god we know that you are a god of hope you are our living hope you are the one who restores and even as you have placed your spirit inside of us may we be lord that one person who is able to just bring comfort and strength by your word into the lives of the hurting Lord, even as we step into these different situations, life situations, we pray that we will be there like a supernatural beacon of light. Father, that, uh, that every work of the enemy will be dispelled. Every fleshly, carnal nature, Lord, will be destroyed. And only the truth of your word and truth, Lord, will prevail in these homes. Lord, we pray, Lord, for all uh, of the students here who are represented on this call, whatever forms of difficulty they may be going through, Lord, you know each heart, you know the lives, the personal, private lives of each person here, Father. God, we pray, Lord, even as we look up to you, lift our hands to you, Lord, we pray that you will send, Lord, your wisdom, your guidance, your strength, your miracles in the lives of your people. Lord, everyone who is in abusive, difficult, assaulting relationships, Father, either through, either through um, the presence of an abuser or because of other conditions, in Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, for a release of your power over their lives and over their situations. Lord, we look to you, God, for changes. You, have, you desire for us to live a life of abundance, abundant joy and abundant peace. And we pray and we seek your peace in our relationships, in our homes, in our lives, God. Thank you, because we can look to you. And you've, you've asked us, Lord, to ask of you and that you will give unto us when we ask according to your will and to your desire. Father, we know, Lord, that you desire that our homes, our relationships, Lord, be one of love, be one of endurance be one lord of of unconditional sacrifice and we pray and we ask god that you will instill this in our homes 
thank you for your goodness even as you send us out into this world may we be effective ministers of your word effective ministers of your love and your peace we ask all these things in your precious name amen amen thank you everybody god bless and we shall meet next week thank you god bless thank you ma'am amen thank you pastor thank you, thank you.